Well, we're moving on with our series. Thomas over here has come back to continue looking at the antecedents, looking at the influences on early Islam, on the origins of Islam. Now, up to now, what Thomas has been doing, he's been walking us through not only what was happening in the East, but also what was happening in the West. And he's been showing how in the East and Persia, there was a whole soup, a mixture of many different types of Christianity, both anti-Trinitarian and Trinitarian. Uh, of course, in the West, there's very much a Trinitarian overview that has now come, taken over the cities, the bishoprics coming into the East. But while this anti-Trinitarianism that then was taken by Islam and made, especially people like Abdul Malik, and we have done a, uh, a really a really good thank you, Thomas, of unpacking Abdul Malik and looking at the inscriptions on the Dome of the Rock and reintroducing Muhammad I and Muhammad II, there is one area that we haven't touched and one area that we need to touch, and that is Andalusia, uh, what is today Spain, but back then Andalusia, way over in the West. And that's what we're going to be doing now, looking at Andalusia, what is today Spain, far in the West, because there was also this percolating type of uh, both Islamic anti-Trinitarianism, which is both theological and a political influence that we need to look at. And I'm going to let you unpack it. This is your area. This is what, in fact, this material I've not really studied at all before. So this will be new for me. So I've got my trusty pen and I've got my pad and I will take notes as you go and show us what was going on there in the West, there in Spain or Andalusia in the seventh century. Well, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, let's ju jump right in. I'm going to sh share my presentation and then we're going to look at what happened in Spain. So today we want to look at the beginnings, like how did the Umayyads even get into Spain? Um, how, how did this happen? The traditional story goes that there was this Muslim invasion um, and we want to look now if that's really what has happened or if there's any nuance to this. And let's start um, with this by looking at who was in Spain before the Umayyads, and that were the Visigoths. Um, so now a bit of background information on the Visigoths. They were an Eastern Germanic tribe who converted to Arianism around the year 300 AD. So Arianism, if you remember, is also anti-Trinitarian, but it's different to the type of anti-Trinitarianism that, for instance, Abdul Malik would have promoted. So Arians, they did believe that Jesus was divine in a sense, but he was created uh, in their view. So he was um, subordinate to God the Father, and there was no, no Trinity. Um, yeah. So then under the pressure of Hunnic invaders, they've entered Roman territory in the fourth century where they became subjects of the Roman Empire. But then um, soon after, Roman soldiers massacred some barbarian families um, who try actually tried to assimilate. And then the Visigoths started to rebel and they actually sacked Rome in 410 AD, which was a major shock for everyone at the time. It was the first time in almost 800 years that enemy troops entered Rome and they also plundered the city. And among other things, they actually took all the treasures from the Jerusalem temple, which Titus plundered in 70 AD. And they took it with them. Um, the Visigoths then roamed through the Roman Empire, but eventually settled in what is today southern France and Spain. Um, by 500 AD, the Visigoths controlled most of the Iberian Peninsula. And eventually they were kicked out of France by the Franks and then basically stuck, stuck to Spain. In Spain, however, um, because it was part of the Roman Empire before, the clergy was mostly Catholic. But also in, within the populace, there were deep sectarian splits. So even centuries later, Charlemagne, uh, the, the Frankish emperor, he fought adoptionist heretics in northern Spain. All right, so let's do another quick jump. So in 589 AD, 
King Ricard I convert to Catholicism. And with him, like the inner circle, like the, yeah, the high nobility basically converted to Catholicism. And they did it mainly for political reasons. At least that's uh, what most historians think. So they need the clergy on their side. And they also wanted the approval of the Byzantine emperor in order to gain legitimacy as kings of Hispania. But most of the, or may, at least many of, of the Aryan nobility didn't like this and there were immediately uprisings. And from the, Actually, from this time on, there was basically constant civil war going on in, in Spain. I mean, it was back and forth. It was in, it typically happens like this. There's um, a new king. He gets um, assassinated. Somebody else comes in. Um, he is now a strong king. But as soon as he dies, there's another civil war. Um, new king comes in. He gets assassinated and so on. So it, it was like constantly a civil war um, from this point on. Just, just so and I'm clear. There really was this. Yeah. Thomas. Just so I'm clear, you're, t you're saying that the nobility, so these are the Visigoths who are Aryan in nature, they're now in Spain. And when uh, King Ricard or Ricared I becomes yeah. Yeah. a Catholic, these Visigoths are the ones that rise up and attack him because they're still Aryan. Exactly. So there are some of some of the nobility follows, follows his lead and joins uh, um, and converts to Catholicism, but not all of them. And we really see this this um, viciousness between between those factions. Um, it's probably not the only reason why they're fighting constantly, but they are definitely fighting constantly. Um, yeah. So I think there were some Frankish um, historiographers of the time who who called it, I think, the Gothic disease or something that they would constantly fight each other. And but. Basically, the high nobility, they have now all converted to Catholicism. So anybody who has a chance on sitting on the throne, they are typically now Catholics. And they, um, they push several synods, or they have several synods in which they push Byzantine theology. But yeah, as I said, so among, among the, let's say, lower nobility, there was strong opposition against those with Visigoth kings. Right now we have to take a look at the East, what was going on there. Um, I mean, we've, we've already looked at this uh, before, but now I wanna look in particularly at the Ibadi tribe. Some of the Ibadi tribes have already converted to an anti-Trinitarian form of Christianity by the 400s. So for example, we know about the Tamim tribe, um, which is a very prominent tribe among the Ibadis. Um, but we also know that the Ibadis were successful merchants, so they lived in Christian communities in Northern Africa. Now, this map you've probably, you probably remember, this is during the war between the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanid Empire. And here now we are specifically looking at these Ibadis. And they came in large numbers into North Africa as auxiliaries of the Sassanid army. And then many of them just stayed there once uh, the Persians retreated. Um, and then in Africa, they would then later join the troops of Muawiyah and Abdul Malik a generation later. So now these anti-Trinitarian Ibadi Christians, they were instrumental in the conquest of Northern Africa, which took place from around 660 to 700 AD. And they spread their anti-Trinitarian religion among the Berbers. And you can see the Berbers here on this map. They are highlighted in orange as well. Now the Berbers, they were already, or at least a lot of Berbers were already Christians un under the Roman rulers or the Byzant Byzantine rulers. But when the Ibadis came in, they spread their religion. Um, and typically how this works is the Berbers, they were a tribal society. So you would go to the tribal leaders and then more or less make them convert and then the whole tribe would convert.
And now going forward, Christian Berbers or anti-Trinitarian Berbers are actually attested to for centuries to come. So we know we know that it worked because it's it's attested to for, for a long time to come. Right, now back to Spain. In the early 8th century, the southern Visigoth nobility, they conspired against the king. And these Visigoth nobles, their territories in Northern Africa, which is still sort of a remnant of Byzantine rule, because with the Visigoths, they basically just kicked out the Byzantines of, out of Spain completely. So they've always had the Byzantines always had a like a small part of southern Spain still, but they have been kicked out. And as part of that, they also took their possessions in northern Africa. And from those territories in northern Africa, these southern Visigoth rulers, they brought in Berber troops as well as Arab auxiliary forces um, who were both anti-Trinitarians. So really what we see initially is that we're looking at anti-Trinitarian troops from Northern Africa who are supporting anti-Trinitarians in Spain in their fight for the crown against the Catholic rulers. But eventually these auxiliaries, they turn conquerors. Um, this, this is very similar to what has happened in, in Persia uh, when we looked at how that got sort of the rule um, got transferred to the Arabs. Um, here we're looking at a similar thing. So we're starting out with a civil war. Arab mercenaries now come in and eventually they become the strongest, um, the strongest group in the, in the country, especially once these Umayyad forces under Musa, Ibn Musa, um, enter Spain. So we don't know exactly why they do this. They, my best guess is they probably, so the these, the Umayyads, they saw their chances. They saw that Spain was basically there for the taking. So they um, took, took a force, moved into Spain, and they knew the Berbers were basically their subjects, so they would have to fall in line. And then quickly, um, yeah, there was, th there was nobody else there who could really um, project power as, as the Umayyads could. Now, this conquest took from 711 to 718. And I'm comparing the story I just told you again to this, um, to the traditional story, that there was just this um, massive conquest, troop, um, not, not starting with the civil war, but just an outright conquest. And for that, really, this time span is relatively short. It's not unheard of, so it's plausible or possible that could have happened, but it is quite short because deploying troops, besieging cities, managing logistics, securing food and all that. And it usually takes time. Then campaigns are usually done in the summertime. Um, Thomas, but Thomas, what's more with... Yes? Thomas, just in the standard Islamic narrative, it is very clear that all of this conquest happens during the Rashidun period, right across North Africa, all the way into Spain, which suggests, which goes against what we're seeing historically, because you're saying distant. Now, the Russian yeah. period goes from 624 up into 661, but you're saying, no, this all happened in 711 to 718, much, much, much later. Yeah, well, I mean, that's um, not even debated anymore in, in like among historians. So the question is, was it a conquest or was it, did it start out as a civil war? But yeah, nobody believes that it happened during the Russian period. See, that's significant um, yeah, just, because this is, again, another nail in the coffin yeah. of the standard Islamic yeah. narrative. Can you see, in yeah. almost every case, when you look at the history, and we've asked you to do this, we've asked all of our sin sifters to do this, when you look at the history that's on the ground, that also confronts completely the, uh, the narrative that all Muslims have been taught. That there was, in, and, and even when I was in seminary, I was taught this in seminary, that the Christians there welcomed the the Umar, Umar and Ab, uh, not Abu Bakr, but Umar and Uthman, they welcomed them with open arms because they saw them as almost saviors from the heinousness of the of the uh, of, of Rome, what was happening up in Rome. And so this is fascinating. What you're saying, this had nothing to do with that early. It happened much, much longer. No. Period, and especially in a completely different century. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, here, that's really not even a debate anymore. So that's. Um... Yeah, 
totally agreed upon 711 to 718 sort of is, is the time span we're looking at. Um, yeah, but now back to this short time span. So what is debated still is, yeah, was it an outright conquest or did it start out um, with the civil war as I've just explained? I mean, again, I think the majority of historians probably would say by now that it started out with the civil war. Um, but the more they sort of incorporate the standard Islamic narrative into their interpretation of history, the more likely they are to think of, an, of it as an outright um, conquest. But what's quite atypical for a military conquest is also that we have very little evidence of destruction. So normally we would expect to see raised cities and, and um, plundered fields and, and yeah, villages that are deserted, all of that. We don't see any of that in Spain either. And the only explanation that tr is traditionally brought up for this is what, um, by the people who think of it as a conquest is that the inhabitants of the major city just all fled into the mountains and left it to the invaders, which seems highly unlikely. Instead, when we actually look again at primary evidence like coins, once again, we see something similar than what we see in the Far East, or not in the Far East, but in the East. We see these local Visigoth the rulers starting to mint their own coins, which again tells us they do not respect the central authority of the king anymore. And apparently they have the power now to, um, yeah, to, to ignore him. So obviously this is a clear, clear evidence for uprisings and um, a civil war, because obviously at the same time, the king would not, would not allow allow them just to, to break off. So in fact, what is happening here is that the Umayyads, they got, gained power through alliances as much as through military victories. So they came in, they were now the strong, once they came in together with the Berber forces, they were the strongest power in Spain and lots of uh, local rulers, they saw their chances um, by switching sides. So we've had, um, we've had alliances between these Visigoths with the Umayyads because they saw like more of an opportunity to live under these anti-Trinitarian anti Umayyads than under the Catholic king of the Visigoths. And then similar to what has happened in Persia, eventually these invaders became the dominant military power. Right? So the Berbers were brought in as auxiliaries for the rebellious Visigoths. When the king's Visigoth army was destroyed, only Berber forces remained, more or less. The Visigoth feudal lords made treaties with the Umayyads once they got involved and then presumably got some political favors and concessions in return. But they also did it for relig religious reasons because they were anti trinitarians so they were, felt closer to uh, the religion of these Umayyads than to the religion of the Catholic king. Well, now we are moving to the West. Mm -hmm. We're now looking really at what was happening in Andalusia, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Spain. And it's fascinating because uh, you, you are bringing into and changing the whole timeline of what we now know because the timeline i have always heard and uh, i think anybody who's listening would also assume uh, what i'll will have uh, this is all that this is really only the only timeline we've ever been given and that is that all of spain and iberia were uh, opened the, welcomed the muslims and they were muslims at this time with open arms this was all happening during the rashidun period this is happening during the time of 634 to 644 and 644 to 656 and so that by 656 uh when ali is uh, comes to power and rules for the last five years before muawiyah uh, that those four rightly guided caliphs they had controlled all of north africa this is what i've been told this is what you've come up with that's happening in the beginning of the seventh century, you're saying, no, 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 no. Look and see what's going on, on the ground. It did not happen that quickly. It happened much more, uh, uh, much more at a pedantic pace. And it was not a conquering. There was no conquering going on. Is what I'm hearing you say. It actually. Well, eventually there was 
eventually there was, but it did start out as a conquest. It started out as a civil war with Arab auxiliaries and mostly Berber auxiliaries. Actually. Okay, well, what I mean yeah. is there's not much destruction going on, whereas what yeah. I had heard, yeah. that this is, you know, they went right across North Africa and they kind of destroyed the Christian church there. What we're not being told is, is that many of those Christians were not Trinitarian Christians at all. So you're bringing a whole nother area. This is something that I'm sure people are going to confront us with. I'm sure we're going to get some kickback on this because I've not even heard this. I assumed that this was all Trinitarian because this is the, this is where the early, these are some of the ch great church fathers come from Carthage, come from this part of North Africa. Uh, the bodies were anti-Trinitarians and they sort of, they um, converted the Berber, Berber forces there. Yeah. And I, I would suggest possibly because this was not so much of a political conquest as what we've been told. It's much more of a theological control. And they've moved them from Trinitarian into anti-Trinitarian, what's what you're saying. Yeah. And then they hook yeah. up then with the Visigoths who are anti-Trinitarian, who have been rebelling back and forth, back and forth there in Spain. They're natural allies, aren't they? Because they're all anti-Trinitarians, both those from exactly. the Visigoths and uh, those exactly. who come across the the Abadis and then of course the Umayyads later on because the uh, Umayyads don't come into the picture until 661 with Mu'awiyah and then of course Abdul Malik. Yeah. But you're saying that this is really happening even later than that because this is after Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is sub, up to 705. You're saying this is yeah. going on that seven year period between 711 and 718. Yes, that's well into the eighth exactly. century that this is happening. <laughs> So, and yeah. it looks like it is not just a conquest, it is a political and theological overtaking and uh, yeah. imposing, but maybe not so much a conquest like we've always assumed. Exactly. So it, it looks like there was a lot of a lot of alliances going on with local rulers against the king. Um, and this was basically half, half the conquest was not a conquest at all, but was done through alliances. Okay, good stuff. This is exciting. All right. I'm, let's see what people say. Do you agree? Are you going to, uh, is this the history you're told? It's not the history that I've come up with. It's not the history that I'm familiar with. But what you have to ask is, is Thomas following that which is on the ground? Look at the coins. Do the coins seem to support him? Yes, they do. So that's why we need to start to reconstruct our whole historical context that's happening there in the 7th century and say, maybe we need to reassess everything we have been told, because this does stand against the standard Islamic narrative. This does stand against everything that I've grown up believing. Uh, but in many respects, I can see how this does make sense as well, because the Umayyads certainly after uh, the Malik is our anti-Trinitarian. We've already gone through that. We looked at the inscriptions. <laughs> that the first Muhammad is not at all the Muhammad of the Islam, but he is uh, a, a another personage, a person, Jesus Christ himself, but in this case, a anti-Trinitarian Jesus Christ, <laughs> nothing more than a human and a uh, nothing more than a prophet. Good. Listen, we're going to move into this. This is going to be the first part of the Spanish Inquisition. Not the, sorry. The, let's do it again. The first part of this. <laughs> Don't even, I better be careful what I say hey, from here on out, because if I say the wrong word, I'm going to get it in the neck. Not the Inquisition. This has nothing to do with the scam Spanish Inquisition. This is the first part of the uh, um, looking at Spain, looking at Andalusia, looking at the Iberian Peninsula. Thanks so much, Thomas. Good to have you back on board, and we'll go right into the next second part of Spain. Jay and Thomas, 4,000 miles apart, over and out. Mm -hmm.